So we're starting a new series called Where's the Proof, where we dive down the rabbit holes of violence and corruption. In this series, we explore public information and we share our findings with our unprofessional observations. I want to start our Where's the Proof series with an issue that's ripping through our nation right now. I'm referring to child protective services and family court corruption. We're gonna see what the law says and we're gonna explore some statistics and data to see what's really happening. We all know that corruption exists, but how deep does it truly go? Let's go exploring and see what we can find. Time to get our nerd glasses on for this. So we're going to start with seeing what the law says. We are going to go to the AmericanBar.org, where they share information on removals and what the law requires. As you can see here, constitutional, federal, and state law are all pretty similar and or work together with the other laws. So you have constitutional case law, which only allows removal if there is imminent risk of substantial harm to the child. Federal law, then in most cases, only authorizes removal upon judicial finding that remaining in the home would be contrary to the welfare of the child. And in addition to that, agencies are required to make reasonable efforts to prevent the need for the removal. State laws go on to state that most jurisdictions require that courts only allow removals when they're is a finding that a child would be in substantial and immediate risk of harm, which reinforces constitutional case law. Now, obviously, every state is going to be different. Every state is going to have their own individual laws. And I'll put a link down in the description for a website. You can get more information on that. And I'll also provide links for everything else that we discuss throughout this video. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at what the laws at the constitutional, federal, and state level generally say, I think it's made very clear that children are not to be removed from their home unless they are in imminent danger of serious harm. So why are so many children being removed from their home if this is the law? We still haven't really seen much in way of specific reasoning as to why children are being removed. So let's see if we can get a better understanding of what's happening. The Child Abuse and Prevention Act was enacted in 1974. While there's been some updates, generally it's remained about the same. So let's hop over and take a look and see what that says. I have a PDF of it downloaded. Again, I can leave a link in the description below. So within the Child Abuse and Prevention Act, in Section 3, for general definitions, it states the term child abuse and neglect means, at minimum, any recent act or failure to act on the part of a parent or caretaker, which results in death, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse or exploitation, or an act or failure to act, which presents an imminent risk of serious harm. So again, it all stems together and works together and all the laws generally say the same thing, but still doesn't really provide a whole lot of information. So let's see what we can find in regards to a better understanding as to what CPS agents may be using for their reasonings. So childwelfare.gov has this page on their website that goes through a bit more information that's a bit more detailed with exactly what is abuse and neglect. We've already seen a couple of definitions in way of abuse, but being that over 40% of children are removed from their home due to neglect, let's see what that says. So according to this, neglect is frequently defined as the failure of a parent or other person with responsibility for the child to provide needed food, clothing, shelter, medical care, or supervision to the degree that the child's health, safety, and well-being are threatened with harm. 
It goes into further detail with some states that have further restrictions and other things that they consider to be neglect. While I'm not going to read through those, you're welcome to pause and read it, or you can click the link in the description below and check out the website for yourself. Okay, so that seems pretty straightforward, but it still leaves so much to question, being that so many children are being removed from their homes. I'd like to go back to the Child Abuse and Prevention Act. There are a few things in there that I think are important to note that Congress noted during congressional proceedings. So back to the Child Abuse and Prevention Act. And I scrolled up from where we were below for the definitions so that we can kind of get an idea of what's going on here. And I actually have some notes that I popped in along the way as I was investigating everything to kind of make it easier for me to remember exactly what it is that we're looking at. As you can see from my handy dandy note, Congress clearly outlined the problems and the fact that states needed to do more to keep families together and provide help and awareness. And this backs up all of the other laws as well, whether it be constitutional, federal, or state. All of the laws across the board make it very clear that a child being removed from their home should be a last resort. It should be done only if the child's life is in imminent harm. And before doing so, they need to make sure that they are offering these parents or caregivers all of their resources and help available to try to better the situation to avoid removing the child from their home. So when we come down here to number 10, you can see that Congress further stress the point, stating that national policy should strengthen families and provide support for needed services to prevent the unnecessary removal of children from families and to promote reunifying where appropriate. So next, I would like to point out this little tidbit that Congress shared, where Congress further points out that both child maltreatment and domestic violence occur in up to 60% of families, which either is present. So that means if there's maltreatment, 60% of the time there is also domestic violence and vice versa. Congress further says that each individual state should adopt assessments and intervention procedures to enhance the safety of both children and victims of domestic violence. So I'm curious, with the research that I've done and the victim's stories that I've heard, it's quite prevalent that when there is any kind of domestic violence involved, kids across the nation are being taken away from a safe parent and forced to live with the abuser, where many times abusers are getting full sole custody of these children. Despite the fact that it is well known that the vast majority of these cases, which include neglect, also have domestic violence involved. Rather than following the law and helping these families get safe, CPS has a tendency to come in, remove the child, and the child either gets put in foster care or gets put into the care of their abuser. So next, we're going to come over to this other tab for this PDF that I have. That is the Kids Count Data Book by Annie E. Casey Foundation. So this is going to kind of give us some more insight on what could be happening within families in America. This reflects that not only is child care a very big problem, there are also a large percentage of families that have to change jobs. They have to quit their job and find a new job simply because they can't find affordable child care or child care that's dependable. So as you can see here, poverty is still a huge problem across the nation. This list kind of provides a bit more insight as to what's going on with children across the country. What are the trends that may be contributing to these neglectful situations? Now, I'm not going to go over all of this data, but I thought I would pull it up and give you the opportunity to kind of check it out and see what's happening. So with the maps, they have overall well-being the economic well-being, education, family and community. They also have a more comprehensive list 
So I'm just going to scroll through these. And if you want to pause to read and, and see where your state ranks or to get more information, feel free. But I'm not really going to go into a whole lot of details. Although I am going to point out that as we look at these, the best, better, worse, and worse tend to have the same rankings across each section. So it's kind of interesting going through and seeing how states compare in one category versus another. So then when you scroll down, down here, they have child well-being rankings to where you can get a side-by-side -side comparison of each state and each category. So why am I showing you all of this? It's important to have an understanding of what the federal law states and different concerns that have been addressed with the expectation of change within state law and practice coming from a federal level. It's equally important to understand what's happening behind the scenes with families to better understand why children are being removed from their homes before we consider the statistics. So for a quick recap, our laws are perfectly clear that no child should be removed from their home unless there is clear and convincing evidence that there is an imminent risk of substantial harm to the child. And that is stated in constitutional, federal, and state law. It's clear that there's a failure in large part of proper help from established government agencies and programs, and more definitely needs to be done to help those who are in poverty. Are you ready to see what the statistics say? Let's hop over to my next PDF tab. We're going to take a look at the statistics from the Adoption and Foster Care Analysis and Reporting System. This report is required every year and it outlines the national statistics for children who are removed from parental and guardian care, as well as adoptions in the United States. Here's the AFCARS report. Now, to keep the data consistent with some of the other statistics that I found, it is widely unreported and there's it's not really a whole lot of information out there that's consistent. So I compiled all of my data and picked a year that most consistently had a wide range of information available, which happened to be 2021. So this is the report from 2021. And we're just going to take a look at a few things here. I do have a little note on here. Here's the website that you can find the Adoption Care Analysis and Reporting System archives. Along with these individual assessments, they actually have the ability for you to review individual states as well. So it's definitely a really cool website to check out just to see the different statistics and information that they have available. So I would like to note that this goes by fiscal year, which in the United States, it begins on October 1st and ends September 30th. This report is done within the fiscal year. So I just wanted to make sure that I pointed that out being that it's referenced through here. So according to this, there were 391,098 children in foster care on September 30th, the end of the fiscal year. So this has specific numbers with those who entered the foster care system and exited, as well as how many were served. Now, I'd like to point out that 606,031 children were served by the foster care system during 2021 fiscal year. Y'all, that's over a half million children. I am sorry, but you cannot tell me there are over half million children in this country that are being neglected and abused every year to the point that they need to be removed from their home. I find those numbers to be a bit excessive. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Another number that I would like to point out here is how 64,985 parents lost their parental rights in 2021. When you compare data from previous years, that number seems to generally be around about the same, give or take. I also find it hard to believe that over 60,000 parents deserve to have their rights terminated every year in America. So when we scroll down here, it gives more in-depth information with the ages of the children who are removed, the sex, as well as the most recent placement setting. Down below that, they also have the case plan goal, which is the goal that the caseworker sets upon removal. 
I'd like to point out first with the ages of the children. I find it a bit scary that the vast majority of children who are being removed from their home are under the age of four. When you take a look at these numbers here, you have 9% of children who are removed are one year old. Old. And within the ages of less than a year, all the way up to four years old, compared to the percentages for other ages, those are some pretty high percentages. I know that it being just a percent or two higher may not really seem like a lot. But when you come over here and look, so you have 9% of children who are one year old, that's 33,000 children that was one year old that was removed from their parents' care. But when you come down here, and even when it gets to the age of five, it drops down to 20,000. And the, it just goes down lower and lower the more that the age increases, which I find to be odd. If children need to be removed from their home because their home situation is so bad, wouldn't those numbers be reflected across the board similarly? Why are there so many children who are younger being removed from their parents' care? Okay, so when we come over here, we can see where kids were placed upon removal from their homes. All levels of law clearly states that removal should be the last resort and help needs to be provided first when possible. As the statistics show, only 4% are even afforded trial home visits. Laws further state that if removal is necessary, every effort should be made to place the child with another family member. Yet as you could see here, only 35% are kept with relatives, while an astounding cumulative 57% is instead placed in unrelated homes or institutions. So let's go a step further and see what the caseworkers are planning long-term upon removal. So when you come down here and we explore the case plan goals, as you can see, only 3% are even planned to find placement with a relative. Out of all the children that are entering the system, only 53% of cases are even planned to be reunified with their parents or primary caretakers. Y'all, 28% of children from the word go, these caseworkers are planning on putting up for adoption. I fail to understand how that is trying to keep families together and using a child's removal as a last resort and last resort only. Clearly, that is not what's happening by the government's own statistics. Okay, so when we scroll down here, I went ahead and I copied and pasted the case plan goals so that way we can uh, compare a little bit easier with the information that they have up here. This is for children exiting the foster care system during 2021. So while only 53% of children removed even had the intention of being reunited, the final numbers of those that ended up being reunited with their families are even lower at only 47%, with only 6% being placed with other relatives. So when you add those who were adopted or placed with other agencies, guardianships, the total number of children that were permanently taken from their parents within the fiscal year of 2021 was a staggering 38% compared to the initial plan of 34%. So rather than helping more families, they actually ended up permanently removing more children than what they had originally anticipated. So I did some research and I looked at a couple of few different news stories, different lawsuits and such that were filed. Well, we're going to take a look at some real reasons why children are being permanently removed from their parents' care. So NPR.org reports that parents are losing their parental rights for failure to re reimburse the government for bills that were incurred for their children being placed within the system. So CPS comes in and removes these children from their parents' care and then sends them a massive bill when they get their children back that the parents are required to reimburse the government for. So the NPR did an investigation and they found that there are 12 states that have this law that they can legally terminate a parent's rights just for owing this bill. So how is that legal? So they're cleared by CPS. CPS puts them back in their parent's care. 
says everything's great. But then the government has the right to come along and say, oh, wait, you owe us money. Sorry, but you're going to have to give us your kids. On what planet does that make any sense whatsoever? And in what way is that even almost legal. Now, it is worth mentioning that while in most cases, in most states, it's not a law that's enforced. However, they did find that it is commonly enforced, particularly in the state of North Carolina. So they did a review of appeals courts decisions over the last two years in North Carolina, and they found that removal of parental rights for failure to pay came up quite a bit, which of course contradicts the best practice and laws for child welfare, which clearly states keeping families together should always be the number one priority. So another article that I found was talking about a Ninth Circuit civil right case from Oregon, where they found CPS investigation tactics to be unconstitutional under the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment. So this case in particular cites practices of extensive interviews with children that were done illegally with intimidation and violated the Fourth Amendment as a seizure. The social worker was found to have lied to get an emergency removal order, violating the Fourth Amendment, unlawful seizure, and Fourteenth Amendment due process, which don't be fooled, folks, this happens all the time. It is very common for social workers to lie and take kids without any kind of legal standing whatsoever, and most of them get away with it. In this case, CPS further kept the safe parent away from the child undergoing an essay examination without consent or a legitimate reason to exclude the safe parent after allegations were made against the father. This was a violation of due process rights of the mother and child under the 14th Amendment. So the United States courts for the Ninth Circuit and their manual of model civil jury instructions under 9.32 particular rights for the 14th Amendment due process interference with a parent-child relationship. It states that parents and children possess a constitutionally protected liberty interest in companionship and society with each other. This liberty interest is rooted in the 14th Amendment, which states in relevant part that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The protected liberty interest is independently held by both parent and child. So the AmericanBar.org has a really fabulous website. They shared an article in regards to social services and constitutional rights, and it helps you navigate the laws and exactly what constitutes a violation of your and or your child's first, fourth, or 14th Amendment rights. I'll make sure to put that link down in the description below. Make sure you check that one out if you're having issues with CPS. So when we come and look at the numbers for the children that are waiting to be adopted, the largest percentage by far is 27% of children who have been in care for less than a year. And this shows just how big of a problem it is that parents are having their rights terminated far quicker and for reasons against what the constitutional law affords. So when we come down here to the placement types, these are the placements for those who are waiting for adoption. And these numbers are heartbreaking, folks. Only 28% of children are being placed with a relative while they wait to be adopted out. 72% are placed with the system. Furthermore, only 1%, which is 604 families, were even given the opportunity to have trial home visits to even work towards a reunification. It's worth pointing out that more children are running away than what are given the opportunity to have trial home visits. Okay, so here we're going to start hitting into the big boy numbers. So these are the numbers for children that were adopted with public agency involvement. Again, the difference in percentages on the ages is really scary, and it reflects that young children who can't even communicate are at extremely high risk of being taken away from their parents. The highest number is 14% of children being only two years old, and that percentage drops all the way down to 9% at age 
four with consistent drops for every year a child is aged. So it's not statistically possible for such a large amount of children to be so young. I mean, 38% of kids removed from their homes were under the age of three. And that jumps to 54%, over half of children taken away being under the age of five. The combined totals for children 6 to 17 are only 47%, folks. How is that even possible? So why are most children removed at such young ages? Is it just a coincidence that there's a high demand for young children? I doubt it. But let's go take a look at the statistics. Okay, y'all. So I went to pull this up and... I, I literally want to cry right now. I Even I wasn't expecting this. And after seeing this, y'all, we have to do something. We have to do something. 98% people, 98% of children who are sex trafficking survivors had previous involvement with child welfare services. So when we dive further into where that number is coming from, an unknown number of kids who disappear from foster care end up trafficked. Out of all of the children reported missing who are likely sex trafficking victims, 60% were in foster care or group home when they ran away. Even during lockdown, this disgusting industry found a way to continue its profits by increasing online recruitment by 22%. You scroll down more and you see that 85% of all commercial sexual exploitation of children in New York had a history with child welfare, with 70% of those spending time in foster care. This is the section where they talk about the 98% of children who are sex trafficking survivors having previous involvement with child welfare system. It says specifically that many were legally in the care and custody of the state while sold by traffickers. Now, how, how is the government going to walk into these families' lives take their children away, force these children into situations and circumstances like this? And then look these parents in the face and tell them what we have to offer and what we are going to do with them is far better than what you could do. So they're better off in our care. And I'll stick this link in the description below so you can check it out on your own time. Crazy stuff, y'all. Crazy stuff. So the statistics are very clear. The vast majority of these sex trafficking victims has everything to do with the state. The common denominator is CPS involvement. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at what the numbers say about how quickly parents are losing their parental rights. Of the children involved with public agencies for forced removals, 61% of parents had their parental rights terminated in less than one year. How does this reflect states helping families? How is it in the best interest for 31,716 children in the United States? Y'all, this is only for one year. So let's go check out the trends comparisons over an extended period of time from USA Facts to get a better understanding of the trauma being illegally forced upon hundreds of thousands of families, showing 1,139,000 900 parental rights terminated from the year 2012 to 2021. More than half a million families every year are threatened with having children removed. Here we have a study that was done by USA Facts about how many foster kids end up in permanent homes. Here with this data, we have trends throughout foster care and adoption. And this goes from 2012 until 2021. Through this 10 years, you can see, y'all, literally over 600,000 families every single year are being served within the foster care and adoption facilities. These are how many families are being investigated every single year. Look at these numbers, folks. Look at 396,411,421,430,000. These are how many children are in foster care every single year. Every single year over the last 10 years, 
a minimum of 207,000 children are entering the foster care system. I would like for us to jump over here and look at parental rights that were terminated. Look at this, folks. Every year, around anywhere between 58 and 72,000 parents are losing their rights permanently to their children every single year. And almost just as many children are being adopted out. These children are being adopted just as quickly as parental rights are being terminated. I don't think that's a coincidence. So further studies through the American SPCC, the Society for Positive Care of Children, shares national child maltreatment statistics showing reports versus findings versus outcomes. Being that it's hard to take neglect numbers seriously, considering the proven problems with inaccurate and unfounded grounds, let's focus on victims of physical and SA. This reflects a scary number of children who are suffering abuse. So where is this coming from? Again, it's important to follow up and gain insight as to what's really happening. For that, let's explore what the statistics say about abuse, which when it involves family is automatically considered domestic violence by account of law. So the next PDF is the Department of Justice Criminal Victimization Report for 2021. There are more recent statistics, but for the sake of keeping our coverage consistent, we're sticking with 2021, since most recent years of reports across the board are spotty. Of 4,598,390, 10 violent crimes reported in 2021, 48.9% of cases were due to domestic violence, with acts being committed by current or former intimate partners or family members. 50.7% of those cases were specifically classified as intimate partner violence, meaning violent acts were committed by a current or former spouse, boyfriend, or girlfriend. It's imperative to recognize that these are the cases that were reported to police. To get a more accurate idea of what's actually happening, let's scroll down for the estimates of unreported violence. So it's estimated that in the year 2021, only half of victims reported their crime of violence that was perpetrated against them. 2020 reflected even more crimes that went unreported. As you can see from this chart, violence doesn't care who you are, your age, your race, your sex, your status, or your income, nor does it care where you live. Only 20.2% of victims in 2021 received victim assistance services for intimate partner violence. Now that we have an understanding of overall violence versus cases classified as domestic violence and IPV, let's see what the numbers say with more detail in regards to the violence that accounts for all violence committed in the U.S. So while this information is pretty overly simplified, Let's hop over to another PDF where we can get a little bit more detailed information. This next PDF that we're going to look at is from the U.S. Department of Justice National Survey of Children's Exposure to Violence. It was published in 2012. It's the most recent one I could find. Uh, that PDF shows a correlation between child victims and offenders. So that way we can get a better understanding of who is doing what within the family dynamic. This really has quite a bit of detailed information in it in regards to children's exposure to violence. But we're going to scroll down here to page four, where you can kind of get an idea of the age and sex of the youth and the type of threats that are made against them. So when we come down here to page six, this data from 2011, published in 2012, shows the type of violence committed against children in their lifetime and the past year, which ranges from a parent pushing them to they saw physical violence if the parent hit them or severely assaulted them. The next page here on figure two, you'll see that 7.8% of youth and 15.8% of 14 to 17 year olds were assaulted by an adult household member. 62% of perpetrators were the father. Only 12% were mothers. 11% was a boyfriend of the mother. 7% were another female and 8% were another male. When it came to a child's exposure to IPV, 90% were eyewitnesses with 10% heard, saw, or were told about injuries. Among all cases, 69% of perpetrators were males, 23% were females, 
and 9% involved both parents. So let's go back to the AFCARS report and make some final observations and wrap things up with what I think this information reflects. So when we take a look at the final numbers available on this report, I find it concerning that states provide detailed data on family structure and relationships of adoptive parents, but not households where the children are being removed. In this day of age, with violence being so prevalent and problematic, we need to do better at tracking more detailed information for accountability. These studies and statistics suggest and reflect a multitude of concerning issues. One, it is far too common for CPS to violate the rights of families nationwide. Two, the term neglect is far too broad to be used effectively or legally, especially considering such a large percentage of children being removed are claimed to be due to neglect. Three, while children are removed from their homes for abuse, studies show that most often the father is the perpetrator. So why are children being put into state care instead of helping women and their children get safe? So that further brings into question what's happening within our family court system in regards to custody, termination of rights, visitations, but that's our topic for next time. So I wanted to kind of work my way into that. That's my ultimate goal to cover is that is such a huge issue in the United States and in the world really. I just thought it was really important that we kind of go over the statistics and the information and give us kind of a foundation for the further issues that we're going to be discussing and diving into. And, you know, if these numbers don't scare the shit out of you, then I don't know what will. I mean, the fact that so many children are being ripped out of their family's care and placed into a system which the government's own statistics clearly reflect those children are getting sex trafficked. And we do nothing, people. These are children. Children. Why are we doing nothing? It's time that we step up and do something. And I totally understand for those who are just uninformed or have no idea what's really happening or the truth behind how deep this corruption truly runs. But if you just watch this, you don't get to use that excuse anymore. Sorry to burst your bubble, but it's time for us to wake up and take our heads out of the sand and help these children. They're innocent victims that don't deserve to be treated this way. So we hope that you'll join us as we go down the next dark rabbit hole of family court corruption. Have a great day. Bye.